there's one thing I'm going to put all my money on in a bet. It's me. Business of Architecture, episode 325. Hello and welcome back, Architect Nation. I'm Enix Sears. This is the show where you'll discover tips, strategies, and secrets for building an architecture practice that doesn't get in the way of you doing your best work more often. Today's episode is sponsored by Smart Practices, the world's only step-by-step business training program that shows you how to structure your practice so the complexity of running a business doesn't get in the way of you doing your best work. Discover more by going to businessofarchitecture.com forward slash smart. Today, we speak with the co-founder of the architecture firm Wingate Hughes, based out of Washington, D.C. The firm Wingate Hughes has made a big splash since they came on the scene and were founded over a decade ago in the year 2010. And I just had to get them here on the podcast to share with us how they've succeeded when so many other architecture firms struggle. In this episode, co-founder Gavin Daniels shares how he and his partner have been able to win work from more established firms, how they've grown their firm uh, to a team of over 20 employees, and how they've been able to use culture to retain and get the best staff members working on their team. So with that, here's my interview with architect Gavin Daniels. Welcome, Gavin, to the Business of Architecture. How you doing, Enoch? Thanks for having me. Yeah, absolutely. Great to have you here. And look... I mean, we're we're smack dab with three, four weeks into this COVID nineteen crisis, and so you're you're coming to me from where? I'm in my basement right now. Uh, my three beautiful daughters are doing school from home upstairs. My wife has the other home office where she's working from home, uh, so I get to to hang out in my workshop. You've seen a lot in your career. You've seen ups and downs. I mean, what are you feeling and thinking right now about this whole situation? I think. Uh, I think differently every day and and I think that every day I wake up I have to think start positive first and foremost and and realize that I can only control today I can't control what happened yesterday and it'd be silly to think I know what's going to happen tomorrow I I mean and based upon what you guys have done and created in your firm this is just Mm -hmm. another challenge another opportunity I would imagine that's really how we have to look at it, Enoch. You're absolutely right. Um, we started in, in 2010 in the economic downturn, the Great Recession, um, and we've made it through ups and downs for 10 years now. So, yeah, we've been through challenges, and uh, we're, we, we can't say we are ready for this one. I don't think anybody was, um, but we're staying positive. We know we're going to get through it. Now, you told me when, before we began the call that your, your career started in tragedy, so you're, you're no stranger. Could you tell us about that? Sure, sure. Uh, it, it's something that, that used to be a lot harder to talk about than it is now. Um, you see, I graduated Texas A&M in December of 1999. And in that year, um, the Texas A&M bonfire collapsed. Uh, my wife and I actually met um, the year prior working on bonfire together. And um, I was there that night when it collapsed. Um, was there helping uh, try to save as many students as we could, um, pulling these huge logs that we had all cut down by hand off of the pile. Uh, that afternoon, I had to drive to Dallas uh, from, for what was supposed to be my last job interview uh, for the job I was going to start in January. When I got there, I found that the, the partners had decided to buy out another partner and put a hiring freeze on. And they hadn't quite informed the person uh, from the construction administration department that was going to be hiring me. Um, so I had to drive back to Texas A&M to deal with the tragedy without a job, about to graduate. What did that experience teach you about yourself? It taught me um, a, a lesson that I've, I've learned over and over throughout the years. Um, there's one thing I'm going to put all my money on in a bet. It's me. I love it. And tell me the thoughts <laughs> behind that. What do you mean by that? And why do you say that? Well, I say it because um, there's always, there are always going to be people that try to help you. Um, there's always going to be things that get in your way. But, but for me, I have to remember the talents. I have to remember the things that I've learned. I have to remember the, the raw creativity that, that I've developed over the years and, and really look at that and say, I, this is, these are my skills. This is what I have to offer. And 
because of that, I'm going to be able to make it. And it's, it's really, it's hard sometimes, harder than others uh, sometimes, but, but on the whole, it served me well over my career. Mm. Amazing. So you said you started your current firm, Wingate Hughes, with your co-founder, right. and that happened in 2010. What, what was the yeah. impetus for the firm coming together? Tell me that story. Uh, so Gavin and I, I met each other uh, through some mutual friends in the real estate community. Um, it was weird for two guys named Gavin to be architects and meet each other. Uh, so we got, we got to know each other, got on, and, and thought that one day we might open a firm together. Uh, I was working for, uh, for a firm called Kling Stubbins at the time, who was eventually bought by Jacob Engineering. And I was, um, at the time we were starting our company, a year off of being laid off, uh, from 2009 during the, the beginning of the Great Recession. Now, while I was working at Clink Stubbins, I was called in for an impromptu meeting. My boss from the DC office called me in. Uh, another woman from the Philly office, who was my direct report, called me in. And the long and short of it was they looked at me and they said, Gavin, you wore a pink tie to a meeting. You wore a pink tie the other day, and it, it really made us question whether or not we should put you in front of people. Now, mind you, at that time, I had brought in over three quarters of a million dollars in fee, which wasn't something that was in my job description. I'd gotten the firm back into Niamey Niger doing uh, overseas building operations for the Department of State. Um, I had secured a wonderful uh, tenant improvement job um, here in D.C., and they were focused on what I looked like. And, and even to the point one of them said, you know, you, you ought to get a subscription to GQ magazine. Well, I, I pointed out to them, I, I do have a subscription to GQ. And if you did, you would have seen that pink tie. <laughs> because that's where I got it from. <laughs> so, so oh. I, was, I, was, I was frustrated. I, I felt like there was, there's a lot of things that, that people can critique me for, Enoch. Uh, they, they could have said that, that I'm a little late to work all the time. My lunches are a little too long, something like that. But uh, they, chose, they chose the way I looked, and they chose to, to talk about the fact that they knew they liked that I brought in a lot of work. But I needed to keep quiet because it made other people feel bad that I was doing that, and I was out having lunch and having coffee. Um, I went home that night and I talked, I talked to my wife and we were on the, and I, just having a beer talking and I assumed she was going to kind of talk me off the ledge. I said, I, I don't think I can go back. I don't think I can work here anymore. I want to call Gavin and uh, talk about starting this firm. And she just looked at me and said, you're, you're going to feel the same way anywhere you go until you start your own company. And so I called Gavin that night, and it was a pretty short conversation. Uh, essentially, are you in? And he said, yes. Are you in? I said, yes. So we'll start planning tomorrow. <laughs> wow, beautiful. Now, with the pink tie thing, was there anything mm -hmm. else going on there? Do you think that was a reason that they used that covered up some other things that were maybe that had bothered them or culturally there wasn't a fit? What was going on behind that, do you think? Yeah, I think, I think there might have been a lot going on behind it. Um, you know, I, I've always been the kind of architect that my bosses really weren't sure they liked, but my clients were really sure they loved. And, and why and is I that? Think, what do you mean? Well, I'll do anything for my clients. And, and I've always bent over backwards for them. And I'll go to extra meetings. I'll do the extra phone calls. I'll go that extra mile for them to get them what I know they need. Um, and I'm not one to follow, here's the exact procedure that the firm set out, so this is what we have to do. If I saw in that a shortcoming, meaning a way that there was a barrier to me and my client. And I don't think that that method really translated well to, to a firm that was doing huge government projects and uh, big, big fees, that kind of thing. Yeah. Now, how have you used this lesson about culture? Because this sounds like a culture issue here. And how have right. you used that to inform your decisions in your firm? When we think about our culture at Wingate Hughes, um, we have three rules that, that Gavin and I created over the years. Uh, the first one is that you have to start every day uh, believing people are good, believing that the world isn't out to get you. Um, we found over the years there are people that are out to get you, but not everybody is. 
guard yourself when that happens, but don't assume everybody is out to get you and is negative all the time. Believe people are good and it's a much better way to start your day. The other one, the second rule, say what you mean and mean what you say. Believing others do the same. We find that removes a lot of the sarcasm and kind of snarkiness and comments um, that we can be genuine to each other and be authentic and talk about how we feel. The, the last one is that we have to get better every day compared to nobody but ourselves the day before. We think we're the best architecture firm in the world, Enoch, <laughs> only compared to who we were yesterday. And right now that means a lot to us. That, that has created like the backbone of, of the culture. Um, but, but we're a firm that's really, um, you can come to our office and be who you want to be, be who you really are, say the things you can't say in your office, act the way you can't act in your office, and really be yourself when you come to Wingate Hughes. Mm. Now, when you say you're the best architecture firm in the world, and compared to who you were yesterday, explain that for me. What do you mean? What I mean is, as a firm, we're working every day on our processes, on our, on our project stream, on what we're doing and how we're designing, how we're detailing every day, and we're getting better at it. So, so we don't compare ourselves to any other firm. Look, I'm not the, I'm not a world-class architect chain, you know, in magazines all over the place. We, we love to fly under the radar a little bit in our boutique design. Um, but we really push ourselves hard and, uh, we've really worked to, to build a name for ourselves over 10 years. And we do it because we keep pushing ourselves every day. How much time would you say do you spend working on the business as opposed to in the business? Tell me about your how you handle this. Well, it's a it's the the great part of the dichotomy of Gavin and I. Um, I'm the I'm the out front kind of face of the company, bringing in the business, uh, developing the marketing ideas and the marketing strategy, um, being the upfront uh, design um, initial design of of the projects. And Gavin is the business arm of it. Um, he's the one that makes sure the projects finish and finish strong, that the details that we come up with in design, uh, here's the best, most efficient, cost-effective way to get a really beautiful detail done. Uh, so we balance each other in that respect. He's the best critic I've ever had. And uh, the two of us really, really balance well. Now, recently we, we've brought in over the last year and a half uh, a chief uh, operating officer that's really taken some of that business side off of Gavin. Um, so that we can really focus on what we do best, which is architecture and design. How many full-time staff do you have right now? And I know you just had you just had to lay yeah. off some people because of the downturn, and that's very unfortunate. But let's say three weeks ago, what? How many full-time uh, staff did you have? Twenty-five. Twenty-five. Okay, so now you're you're about twenty. Yeah. Even when you were back at Clean Stubbins, you said that you were bringing in work. And right mm -hmm. now you're the face of the company bringing in the work. I mean, this is the right. backbone of any enterprise's ability to acquire clients. How mm -hmm. did you bring in those, those projects when you were working at that previous firm? When I was working at, at Clean Stubbins, uh, one of the ways that I brought in work were to talk to people that you don't, what am I trying to say? Be, you want to get to know folks at, and understand where they're coming from and who they are without this idea of, Oh, can I use you to get work? A lot of the relationships that I've built over the years are ones with people that I want to work with, but I really enjoy personally. Uh, the perfect example is this uh, overseas building operations. Um, at the time, I was with a, with a buddy of mine from Texas A&M. His name was Jonathan Balmos. Uh, he went through the construction science program, and he was doing work over at the State Department and brought this opportunity. And I like Jonathan. We were friends, you know? Yeah. And it wasn't like, I only want to be his friend if I can get work out of him, if I can get something. And I've always believed in, in mutually beneficial relationships, meaning I have to give something before I can get something. And, and I, I want to work with people that feel the same way. So when you look at starting the firm during, during the last Great Recession, which is no right. small feat, let's face it. <laughs> when you look back at the lessons that you learned, um, growing a firm of, of 25 people, uh, winning the kind of work that you've won, creating the kind of culture, this is, this is no small task. I mean, let's be very clear here. Uh, yeah. So, it's, it's tough. 
Congratulations. What did Thank it you. take and what do you think are the keys to both your success? And then later, let's talk about the things that you feel you could have done better that have hampered your maybe the lessons learned. So let's start with sure. the successes. What do you think were key really for you guys to have the successes that you've had? For us, one of the major keys to success um, was the community here in D.C. Um, I've been here since 2004, and Gavin and I were in, in a, a group of folks called Real Estate Group, and it was still exists, it's still around, it's wonderful. It's a group of uh, folks under 40 in, in and around the real estate community. Having that connection was, was the first part. Um, and you, you remember the movie Goonies? I'll, I'll put it in these terms. <laughs> oh, we love it. Love, come right? on. We're okay. the same generation. Of course, I remember I know, Goonies. Right? Great. Right, right. <laughs> well, uh, fun fact, uh, Gavin Bowie had not ever seen Goonies when we met. Uh, almost broke the partnership up. Uh, just, I mean, how, how could us. you do it? I mean, how could you move <laughs> ahead after that's yeah, been right. revealed? <laughs> right. we, got, we got that roadblock uh, out of the way quickly. Uh, so when we first started, um, we had a lot of folks our age in the industry. And essentially, I'll give away some, some, some secrets. You know, we, we started a, a, some rumors that were about us. Um, one was that we were the fastest, hottest young architecture firm in the city. Uh, fastest growing, uh, hot young architecture firm in the city, and that we were the go-to architecture firm for startup, tech, high-growth entrepreneurial companies. Uh, became a self-fulfilling prophecy in that we found people um, that, that really started to believe that. But the, the one that I really like the most is that, that scene in Goonies, when they're down at the bottom of the well. You know, Chunk was off trying to find the police, and you had Andy sitting on the bucket ready to go up, to, to her boyfriend and, and Mouse had just taken the quarter back out of the wishing well saying that was for his dream, his dream like that, that never came true. And then there's Mikey and he says up there, up there, it's our parents' time. It's our parents' time up there. Down here, it's our time. It's our time down here. This was a story I told countless times as we were starting the company to my peers in real estate and construction, because it was our time in our early 30s to say, we can wait until somebody hands it to us, which won't happen. Or we can take it now and let, let the guys who came before us, who are brilliant, we are blessed with some of the most brilliant uh, folks in real estate and, and mentors in and around the DC area. They're great, but they didn't wait for somebody to hand it to them. They worked their, their, their butts off for it. So I started this feeling that it was our time. And I realized that the guys that were my age that were coming up didn't have that architect that they'd worked with for 20 years. You know, in, in commercial interiors in D.C., it's really a lot of who, which brokers do you know, which tenant represent, representatives do you know, which landlord representatives do you know? Well, the guys that were in their 50s at that time they had that architect they'd been working with for 20 years. The guys from my generation didn't. And I, I forged friendships that, that are still here to this day. There's some folks that I've made great friendships with that we've never worked together, but we support each other. And, and it's more than just did I make a fee off of that relationship. It's what did I, I, I have a friend that's going to be there for my life. And, and it's somebody that I can count on that will support me. And, and we do the same for them. That's, that's really the core of the business and how we started. I hope that answers your question in kind of a, a roundabout way. It does um, perfectly. And so looking at how about the team? I mean, bringing the team together. So you have this great network and, and, mm -hmm. and you're, you're meeting people who are your same age. So you're sort of kind of all growing together and breaking mm -hmm. into this market and being able to create these relationships and, Starting to get work. How did right. you go about hiring team members? Any mistakes along the way there? Um, we definitely made a lot of mistakes uh, along the way. Um, we tried to find at the beginning, um, I think, too many people that were like me. And uh, meaning? Um, a little meaning um, brash personality sometimes. Um, uh, Folks that um, were very 
in the mindset of I can do it, leave me alone. Um, and building that team, we had a great team as far as a culture in that we were the renegades of architecture in DC. Um, and that part was great, but, but from a cohesiveness of we're going to work closely together and there's not going to be a lot of friction. I was tough at the beginning. I, I'll be honest with you. And, um, it's tough when you try to, and I've heard you talk about this on your podcast, you know, how do you, how do you build that firm that you can step away and just do the things you really need to be doing? Um, yeah, I'm not there yet. <laughs> We're still figuring that out. You, you're, you're a big help and inspiration to think, and I can get there listening to the folks that you interview. Um, but, but it is tough. And uh, we have had folks come and go. Um, we do have a difficult place to work for uh, or difficult firm to work for in the sense that we expect a lot um, and from our design standards um, we don't just recycle designs we don't recycle ideas we do really think about each project as unique and bold and that doesn't matter it doesn't matter for us if you're a client that's 5,000 feet with $50 a foot to spend on your office or 5,000 feet with $500 a foot spent we've, we've done both we've done them for more we've done them for less the key is you have to have great design and it's hard to find people that are really up for that task on the whole once you make it through your first year at wingate hughes you you've got as much experience as people um in two years at other firms uh, because we we really try to give our folks a holistic sense of every part of the business from the proposal to how you're doing all the way to the end to maintaining the relationship with the client and i think that's been one of the things that that's made it hard. I love this question because it's something I don't think enough about um, that looking back, you know, um, we maybe shouldn't let people do all the different parts of the projects. You know, I came from firms that were really siloed. One person was the project manager. One person did the, the floor plans. One person did the details. One person did the construction administration. For myself, I never liked doing that. I really thought it was important for my clients to be part of all of that process. So in commercial interiors as a firm, that's what we do. That's what you do, meaning you, your staff, you let them take yeah. on all parts and all, all aspects of the project absolutely. and not, not getting siloed. That's right. Got it. And how do you find that you find talented people? I mean, let's let's face it. This is the backbone of a good organization <laughs> is finding amazing people and you've had to learn some lessons along the way. Yeah. How do you find um, your staff? Like a lot of a uh, lot of companies, the best people we find are through uh, from our own staff, um, from friends and referrals of our own staff. Um, DC, is, as you know, is a highly competitive market and uh, recruiters are are sometimes the, the lifeblood of where you have to go um, to at least get the talent in the door to talk with you. Um, so many folks are, are using recruiters these days. Um, so we found that. And it's unfortunate. I wish it wasn't the case. Um, but that's, that's, that is one of the avenues that we have to use. Because our, our model as a company doesn't really say we can hire part-time people um, that work from home all the time. That's a hard thing to do just to have production folks. Because the model says to our client, we're there, involved. Your team is your team from beginning to end. I can't have a remote team in that sense. It makes it tough. And that's something we, we've struggled with. When, when you're looking at the challenges, right? Mm -hmm. So we talked about the success, the, the things you did that you feel have really contributed to your success. Where, can you share with us some ways that you stumbled uh, in, in your journey as an entrepreneur, as a business owner, things that you'd be comfortable sharing with us? Oh, I've made zero mistakes in it, ever. I figured, you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I, I think one of the, the biggest mistakes that we made early on um, was not charging enough and not really, and, and being so concerned about that next job and whether or not we were going to get it, that, that we would do anything to get a job sometimes. And we didn't rely on the good work that we'd done as much as we really should have to say the work's going to come. The work's been coming. It's, we've built up a great network of people. So relax and maybe you need to charge a little more. And this was at a time when, when our win rate was uh, 80, 90% of the jobs we went for, we won. And we learned 
couple of years later, that was not really the right ratio. <laughs> and uh, yeah, that's that's most people. Some people would think that's a great thing, but no, you realize very really quickly that that's mean, showing that there's something off here. Right. Right. And what did what did what impacts did that have of of not charging what you needed to on the projects? It meant that we were doing too many projects at a time, and and when you do that. Um, one or two things will happen. Your staff will get so stressed out um, and, and just work to death um, or something will get missed and, and your the product won't be uh, as high quality as you know it should be. Um, sometimes both happen, right? That's not, that's not, let's not kid ourselves. Um, we are, we've been so fortunate over the years though that everybody who has worked for us has been intensely loyal during that time that they're working for us, that they, they don't want to let the company down. They don't want to let themselves down. Um, so they do work their fingers to the bone. And we've never had a situation where we say, okay, we need everyone to come in over the weekend or stay late so we can get this done. The whole people just do it when they know they need to do it. And, and that's been one of the cool parts about our culture, but it's not the way we want to run the rest of our lives. Uh, just, just working nights and weekends all the time. And are you out of that mostly now? I mean, it's, it happens every now and then, I'm sure. Sure, it, it does. It does. Uh, but, but on the whole, uh, we're, we're out of it. I think that we're going to see some of it in 2020 um, because we're going to be trying to recover right now. Um, but, but look, uh, starting January, we're on track to have a record year. Amazing. Now, in terms of managing the staff, coordinating the staff, building the team, mm -hmm. inspiring, leading them, who takes a more direct role in that side of things? Is it you or is it Gavin? That's Gavin, uh, primarily. Um, I'm the I'm the cheerleader, and the, and the inspiration. I started uh, over a year ago, a year and a half ago, I guess, um, writing a, a an email to the staff every Monday, just to kick off the week. And some days it would just be some architecture theory. Uh, some days it's just something silly that I thought of. Uh, on the whole, there's spontaneous emails and talking about a great week that we were going to have and, and just something positive for the staff to start their week. Amazing. Just the memo from one of the chiefs, basically. Yeah. Yeah. One of my, one of my favorite ones. Uh, do you remember the book In Praise of Shadows? No. It's a, it's a wonderful Japanese book written, um, I believe, in the 40s. And it really meant a lot to me in architecture school. And it struck me and I thought about it and I got to share that with the staff. And it's, it's really about understanding depth in architecture and the importance of shadows and, and the way light casts shadows on things and, and just paying attention to uh, the parts of architecture you don't see. And there's a reason that those are important too. So it was a cool book and just a, just a neat thing to be able to share. Um, we had a, a charrette recently where we uh, read Kenneth Frampton, <laughs> and uh, that was that was a trip for for some of the interior designers who had never read a lot of uh, architecture theory back in school. Uh, I'll we bet, had a great time, I'll bet. great time talking about that. <laughs> They're like, now we understand a little bit more why you are the way you are. You're right, like, yeah, right, that's right. that's right. Yeah. yeah, that's right. Yep, yep. So. Where where to from here? I mean, where are you excited about headed? What are the challenges you see ahead of you? And where do you want to take Wingate Hughes? So we're excited about opportunity right now. We think that um, as a firm, we take diversity and, and say, it's not going to beat us. We're not going to lose. Um, so one of the places that we're taking the firm right now is is that place to say to to clients and prospective clients, let us do work for you now. I know the project's not ready. I know you may not have made a decision, but we have time. So let us work with you up front. And, and what we're finding, just to, I mean, this is a couple short weeks, is a real openness to this idea of working together, um, sometimes before the project's ready, sometimes it's something they've put on hold, uh, sometimes it's, it's planning with some of our, our landlord friends, and, and talking about different amenities that they might need to put into a building. But it's, it's given us an opportunity to reach out to folks and say, we're there, we're there for you right now. And we know you may not be ready, but 
but we are, we are here and we can do some work and we're doing that for a couple of clients right now, doing some initial planning and, and programming and design conceptualization that we may not be compensated for. If they end up competing the job and we don't win, okay. But we started a great relationship with somebody and, and we know on the whole that gives us a much better chance to win. So a lot of times, I think you, you were even talking about it on your podcast, right? Where um, lower fees, faster schedules <laughs> all the time. How do you not get caught in that cycle? This is giving us a chance to reset the schedules. So we're actually working with people earlier. And that's, I think, going to prove really valuable to a lot of our clients that we have time to spend. We can all take a breath and really dig into the project a little bit more than we might have if everything was fine and we were rushing just because the lease got signed and we have to get the construction documents in. Mm. So that excites us right now. Now, it, it leads into a question about, about uh, yeah, I went and checked out your website, fantastic website, by the way. One Thank thing you. I did notice is that your messaging is very sophisticated. I mean, I see a lot of architects' websites, and you have managed to apply some very, very sophisticated, subtle that most people might not notice, but very subtle and very powerful messaging and communication on the website. I mean, what's the background in that? Where did that come from? To, to me and to how are you able to achieve that? Because well, that didn't I happen by accident. No, it, it didn't. Um, I'll, I'll first and foremost shout out to to our PR marketing agency, Craft. Uh, if you go to craftdc.com, you can find the best the best PR marketing agency in in the country, in my opinion. <laughs> um, Craft did a great job of collecting and capturing nine years of of me, and and the way that I speak, the way that I talk to our clients, the way that I talk to our staff the way that I give a pitch and somebody finally put that into words, you know, Gavin and I've been just running so hard um, for, for 10 years. We don't always have time to write down the gold when we say it. And we think a lot, we, we first uh, really bonded over Bruno Zevi of all things. And, and we both really dug architecture theory and, that that level of sophistication is something that that we bring to our staff, we bring to our clients, um, but sometimes we bring it in a bit of an unorthodox way. I'll, I'll give you an example. Uh, our portfolio is in record albums, and inside the record album um, are singles of all of our projects. So you pull out the twelve by twelve pieces of paper, and those are our projects. Um, that's something craft we we had before we met craft. And now that we are using them, that the level of that messaging has gotten a lot more sophisticated. Um, because in the past, so much of our marketing was just a knee jerk, me leading something, doing it when I have the time to do it and putting something out. And we've done some really cool stuff over the years. Um, we gave out uh, grappling hooks to clients um, all over the, the region. Um, and and the, the tagline was F ladders. Um, and our, our clients can, can find their own way up. And it was a, it was a unique gift. We gave away uh, 16 ounce ribeyes with two Miller high lives in a cold packed box that we deli hand delivered all over the city, um, just to help people take a summer break. Um, but our marketing has never been cohesive until now. So craft has really helped us take that message of we're, we're rebellious but we're sincere and we're authentic and we think very deeply about ourselves and about our clients uh, and really put some structure around that. Mm, yeah, I mean, that's the power of investing in the right experts. I couldn't agree more. Awesome. Well, Gavin, Gavin Daniels, co-founder of Wingate Hughes, thank you for joining us today and sharing your amazing journey with us here on the Business of Architecture show. Absolutely. I really enjoyed it. Evie. Thanks so much for having me. And that's a wrap. Today's episode is sponsored by Smart Practices, the world's leading step-by-step -step business training program that's helped more than 103 architecture firm owners structure their existing practice so the complexity of business doesn't get in the way of their architecture. Because you see, it's not your architecture or design skills that's holding you back. It's the complexity of running a business, managing projects and people, dealing with clients, contractors, and money. So if you're ready to simplify the running of your practice, go to businessofarchitecture.com forward slash smart. 
to discover the proven, simple, and easy to implement smart practice method for running a practice that doesn't get in the way of doing exceptional architecture. The views expressed on the show by my guests do not represent those of the host, and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, pledge, warranty, contract, bond, or commitment, except to help you conquer the world. Carpe diem.